So well, we'll go ahead and get started. I'm going to sit in for uh, the chairman and the vice chairman. Uh, and if uh, Arturo Domingos uh, comes, he's probably dealing with traffic. Uh, he can take over. So we'll call this meeting. It is uh, 606. This is the Port of Entry Advisory Committee. And it's Wednesday, December 7th at City Council Chambers. The first thing we'll do is do a roll call. And Gene Lindgren, that's myself, I am present. Uh, Carlos Fernandez, don't see Carlos. Rafael Miner. Yeah. Jose David Gonzalez, he was excused out of town. Guillermo Tich. Present. Present. Luis Hinojosa. Present. Juan Pascal. Present. Arturo Dominguez. Milo Richer. David Puig. William Young. Gonzalo Frida. Present. Robert Morris Jr. Present. Gary Jason Inojosa. Present. Gerardo Maldonado. Okay, thank you. We have a quorum. Uh, Director Limon, do we have any citizens' comments? I have not received any, I have not received any comments. Okay, all right, thank you. The next item on the agenda, item four, is approval of the minutes from our last meeting, October 26, 2022. It was di distributed by email earlier today. Do we have any comments? Nope. Could we entertain a motion? Sir, I can take a... No, uh, you need to be the first one. Okay. You make the motion? Yep. Okay, thank you. Do we have a second? Second, thank you. Okay. And... All those in favor of approval of the minutes? Aye. Any no's? Minute approval passes. Item five, section one, uh, next item on the agenda, items for discussion, is the presentation by Clean Air Coalition on impacted business and any other matters incident thereto. Sure, we can hold on. She may be coming from La Boca. Patrick got through her English. Yeah, so uh, in the meantime, we're waiting on some of the presenters and, uh, and, and, uh, and folks that would like to be here for the items one and two. We will skip to item three, discussion and update regarding the insufficient fund U-turn survey and any other matters incident there too. Good evening, members of the committee. Alma Cruz, uh, marketing manager for Bridge System. Um, let me put the presentation. Um, as you know, in September, we discussed doing a survey for U-turns on commercial crossings at Bridge uh, four, 3 and 4. Um, this is item 5. Uh, four, right? Uh, during the survey that the timeline was from October 11 to November 30th, we had a total of 549 um, surveys. You can see that it was 235 during the month of October, 314 during the month of November. They might not match with the amount that we have reported for the month of October because, of course, we started a little bit late in the month. And we had some instances where the driver did not cooperate to fill out the survey. Out of the survey, we were able to dissect that 96.86% is Spanish speaking, 
78% of those are drivers, 17% are employees, 3% are owners, and 2% decided not to disclose uh, their relationship to the account. The recommendation is to send the communication out in Spanish because of the language, correct? Um, now, out of the questions, our questions were, were you aware that the account didn't have funds? 95% of them responded that they were not aware. 53% um, responded that they were not aware that they could add money online, telephone, or in person. 63% mentioned not knowing that there was an auto replenish, uh, replenish option. Uh, and out of that, we decided, or I decided to make sure that we had the information regarding specifically the ones that replied that they were owners. Out of the owners, as you can see, it's very similar. The majority responded that they were not aware. It was only 19 out of the total amount of surveys that mentioned that they weren't owners and that mostly were not aware that they could have those options in hand. Um, because of the low contact with ABI account holders, an eBLAS was suggested as a collabor collateral effort to reach the correct audience, which is the owners of the ABI tag. This is the um, eBLAS that was sent. Um, you can see it here. Um, this eBLAS, we send it with a frequency of every two weeks. The first one that we sent had an open rate. We sent it to 5,194 subscribers, I'm sorry. The open rate was 39.4%, 628 bounces, four unsubscribe, 15 clicks of action, and then you have the desktop and mobile open rate. Now, we resend it yesterday, two weeks. You can see the difference is four less subscribers. The open rate continued to be uh, 34, around the 30 something percent. Um, we had less bounces, we have less unsubscribes, and more clicks to action. It's the, the, the users are responding to the, to the e -bless. Now, according to Constant Contact, trade and transportation industry standard open rate is 32%. So we're doing good, we're well within the norm. And na national uh, numbers or standards for an open <coughs> rate is 21%. So it's really good information. You can also see the heat map that the users are actually clicking and where they are clicking. We're not only making connections with them regarding uh, adding funds to their account because that eBlast redirects to that site, but we're also being able to get more followers for our social media and in that way continue communication, direct communication with them. Now, I don't know if you want me to continue. This is item number five. Any questions? And item number five. This is in regards to the increase on ABI users for non-commercial. Please proceed, Ms. Cruz. All right. Uh, as you can see, the billboard that was promised, it's right now running in Bridge One at the outlet shops. You can see the video and picture of it. It's looping every 40 seconds. This is the campaign to increase ABI users. It's also running at Bridge Two. It has great visibility, and it's also looping every 40 seconds. It is provided both English and Spanish. Now, this same advertisement is posted on social media. We are making sure to seek support and providing or sharing this information by sister, City of Laredo sister pages. And we are actually posting every other day in our story, and uh, we're doing wall posts. The flyer, we are printing 20, 240,000 copies. They will be double-sided, English and Spanish, both, um, yes, English and Spanish, and distributed with the crossing receipt at the bridge system to our cash payers. Any questions? Does anybody have any questions? This looks like great work. Uh, are, are we continuing the surveys into December? Um, we decided because of the amount of traffic that we're having right now, and it does take a little bit more time to stop the, the process and give the survey to fill out to um, be the deadline, the stop date to November 30th. Are, are there any plans to reinstate it in January? We can, yes. Yeah, I guess it's just in my opinion that that provides that extra educational moment when, uh, especially when a lot of the people didn't know about the replenishment option. Um, 
Anybody have any other questions or comments? I can also send the survey via email. That way we are targeting directly the ABI owners. Thank you very much. Thank you. Since we're on the topic of, of uh, ABI shortages, shall we review the metrics then for October? Um, yes, we can. Okay. Um, committee members, good evening, Yves Limon, for the record. Um, as a rec recommendation by, by you all here, also uh, requesting additional ABI lanes. I don't know if you've noticed it, but at Bridge 2, we have set up uh, lane five as dedicated ABI as well. So we have two lanes dedicated for ABI users, and we have four lanes for cash paying customers. So if you are not aware, I know we're running um, marketing campaigns, especially coming into our um, heavy uh, traffic times with paisanos uh, coming in for the holiday season. Um, also uh, to let you know that um, the route uh, for the ABI users will be uh, set up this Friday um, and will continue in place through uh, the 27th of December. So you have the special ABI route for our local commuters and um, two exclusive lanes mm -hmm. that will be there for your uh, our customers' uh, convenience and um, not to get caught in the traffic of IH-35. Excellent work, excellent update, thank you. Good evening, committee. Kent Richard, Bridge, um, for the record. Um, I did give you a couple of handouts, the insufficient funds for the month of October. Um, as you can see, for World Trade Bridge, we had 385 U-turns. That went up a little more than our normal 320, 330. Uh, gives a breakdown on the number of counts that has, you know, one account had 14 U-turns for the month. I have talked to the front office and they assured me that they are making phone calls to these companies that continues to have these U-turns uh, so they can add more money to their account, whatever it is, to try and get this number reduced. So it's a continuing job to try and get it lower. Um, I did look at the new November numbers. Uh, we don't have the breakdown yet on the number of accounts, uh, but we're looking about 330 U-turns uh, for the month of November. So we're still hanging into those, you know, low, 300s at this point, but we will continue pushing and hopefully we can get this number under 300 sometime soon. Yeah, I think we're all hopeful that the efforts, the social media, the email blast, mm -hmm. the, uh, the, uh, the signage, uh, and then the fines will eventually stick and we'll see those numbers come down. Yes, because believe me, I want that number to go down and you know, it'll help the industry. Great to have the traffic flowing and not having to stop it because of all these U-turns. Anybody have any questions? Yes, yeah, one, one question. Is this one account that had 14 U-turns? Yes. Um, it's being the same account or is it a different 14 one? 14 U-turns for that one account, yes. And they assured me they have been calling that customer to, we need to get that number down. It's not acceptable. Is that a good idea to um, he has had some on the prior months. I don't know those numbers off the top of my head, but um, I'm making sure that they are making phone calls to this, all these people, especially the ones that are three, four, five, six, you know, the, the ones that are one-time offenders, they are still reaching out to them and letting them know as well. Um, as well as when they come in to pay, you know, then let, let's put some more money on your account we don't want to have all these U-turns going on. What's a quick, a quick fix to this could be that uh, if you go like more than three times, that the fine goes up. Uh, we've discussed that in the past. I think it would be a good idea to implement that, and especially at 14. Yep. After three, after 10, after 14, I mean, the fee should be different from someone that does it 14 times and one that does it once. I know if it was my company, I would want to make sure I have enough funds not to have to U-turn to get these penalties and fines. You know, right. Wouldn't it sting a little bit more if, you, if we increase the fee for charges for insufficient funds after the fifth time? 
Well, more than three, because it, it clearly shows that 14 year terms, he, he doesn't even care. <laughs> One drive, one company has three or four. The account gets empty, and then three drugs cross. I can see where automatically he has three, and that might not be the case of uh, blatant disregard. But I can't see where fourteen would be that case. Yeah, in this case, in this company, they had like three or four on a particular day, and then it it happens again, and it just you know keep even going just, up. Yeah, up he needs to be. You know, charge a higher fee. But it, it wasn't one every day for like 14 days consistent. You know, each day had two, three, four at a time. And then a few, few good days, and then it would happen again. What is the fee then? $25? $25? $25? $25 plus the the fee per axle. Mm -hmm. You know, so a five axle, I think if it's what? <laughs> 25 plus 2875 you know 50 something mm -hmm. well, good, good discussion uh, the, the item on the agenda today is actually to have this discussion if we wanted to consider making some changes and recommendations to pass along <coughs> to the city council we'd have to have an item on the agenda with possible action or right. uh, this is just a discussion item at this point Do we want to take up a decision at the next meeting? I mean, coming into 2023, you talk about tier, making a tiered system. After three, you pay 50. After 10, you pay 100. Right. I mean, we need to at least consider it. You know, the numbers have been great, but we're sticking at that 300. I think the intent is there, and they see that. But obviously, it's a trade community. I mean, I don't want to hamper it. But at the same time, that congestion on Mines Road. It's being hampered. <coughs> how serious are we taking it? Well. You know, as a board, as a committee, we're taking it serious and we're putting their feet to the fire, but there's only so much we can do, right? And so I would say the next approach would be maybe a tiered system. At least uh, discuss it at the next meeting. I see some heads shaking. I think that's probably a good idea to have that at the next meeting. At the very beginning, we were having like over 500 U-turns in the month, so we have seen a decrease, but now it's kind of stagnant at that. In about half our... our one once per month, but then the other half are made up of two, three, four, five, six per account. Well, we will continue. Uh, we will continue to educate our customers, and and um, if it continues, then we can take your suggestions to city management and and proceed with your recommendations. Well, I, I'm here now, and so I I don't mind taking. Having uh, Ms. Limon draft a, a, a revision to the ordinance and introducing it to the council in the first meeting of January, um, uh, we hear your recommendations loud and clear, and we feel I feel I I agree with you. I think uh, it, it's and we need to continue to educate. Uh, I like the tiered system. I think it's a good idea, and we can certainly uh, bring a, maybe bring you the draft. For your meeting, so that we and then and then you can kind of help us navigate through that draft, and then on the second meeting, Miss Limon, we'll introduce it to the council for their consideration. So let's have a draft ready to show you uh, to see how you all feel about it. You're the industry that will directly be impacted, and and your input is is good to have. So would you all like a draft instead of coming back and starting? We're already here. We're hearing you. Let us move. That just lets us move a little faster. Yep. And I think that also uh, d does not send the message that we're an uncompetitive port, right? We're, we're talking about accounts that are, that are causing U-turns multiple times per month, uh, per month. So I think that's, that's uh, I'd like to take you up on that. Okay. <clears throat> we'll, we'll present a draft to to you all at your next meeting, mm -hmm. and, and then after we hash it out, we'll take it to council for introductory ordinance, because it's going to be an ordinance amendment. Thank, Thank you. you. Ms. Vimon, was there, you may have mentioned it in the past, I don't remember, but when they get to a certain threshold in their account, do they get an email or a text or something saying that they've come to a threshold? So they Yes, they do get notified. Um, the owner gets notified, and the drivers also see the yellow light indicating that they're running low on funds. 
I can see where the drivers might say they don't know what that yellow light means. So, but uh, if they're getting, the owners are getting an email or a text or something that they've reached a threshold, then there's really not much excuse for them to not take care of that. And we'll, we'll specifically target uh, the account holders that, that had insufficient fund returns uh, with emails to remind them of all the um, possible options to deposit money into their account. Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just had a question, Ms. Limon. If they put a credit card down, how come you cannot charge the credit card when you see that it's running low on? If they if they participate in the automatic replenishment, <coughs> yes, we do. And why don't you ask them, especially these companies that have a lot of U-turns? We do have that option, but it's not mandatory that everybody have a credit card on file and participate in the auto replenishment. I mean, everybody manages their business different. Uh, we have customers that mail us checks. We have... Um, Customers that their drivers go right before they cross and deposit their toll for their crossing, get back into their truck and cross. So they manage, every account holder manages their accounts differently. Uh, but we will continue to encourage the auto replenishment. Okay. My, recommend, my recommendation will be to include a PayPal as a mirror of payment. Because in that way, if, the, if we have a Mexican company and they need to replenish right now, immediately they can go through PayPal and receive the funds in a couple of minutes. We'll, we'll look into <coughs> that option. Yes. We have it. We don't have PayPal, right? Well, it would be a matter of creating a, uh, an account. We need to check with our finance right. department mm -hmm. to see if we can create PayPal. I'm not sure that we can. Well, we'll bring it back as, a, as part of what we're going to bring back to you to let you know we have that ability to do that. It, it will be really helpful. I it's think so, great. too. Yes. I think so, too. I think there's an overall issue with credit cards uh, uh, throughout the city collection in some situations. So that's what I'm learning. Okay. But we'll, we'll bring you a report on that. Perfect. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. We, um, let's go back to item 5-1, presentation by Clean Air Coalition on impacted business and any other matters incident thereto. Okay. I'm not exactly sure how to do this, but... Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you so much, and members of the commission and staff. My name is Trisha Cortes. I'm with the Rio Grande International Studies Center, and we're part of the Clean Air Laredo Coalition. I'm here with Council Member Vanessa Perez and Valentin Ruiz, who's also active with us. Um, Welcome. We're here. Welcome. Thank you. Okay. And uh, we're here to update y'all on sort of where things are with the issue. Um, uh, regarding um, ethylene oxide emissions, which is uh, um, centered in the Killam Industrial Park off of Mines Road. Um, and we wanted to bring y'all up to speed and then make an ask of your groups. Um, so just as a reminder to bring uh, everybody up to speed, um, ProPublica um, issued um, their report earlier this year. It was a multi-year investigation. Um, and into, into Midwest Laredo, and the whole reason why this is so significant is because of how dangerous this air toxic is. Um, the EPA regulates close to 200 air toxics, and ethylene oxide is in the top two or three in terms of its, um, in terms of how dangerous it is, dangerous it is to the human body. 
So six years ago, and the science on ethylene oxide has been evolving. In December 2016, uh, the EPA did reclassify it as a class one carcinogen, meaning it's a known human carcinogen. And at that time, they uh, revealed that ethylene oxide is 60 times more toxic to children and 30 times more toxic to adults than previously estimated. And the company here in Laredo, knowing this, didn't scale back or say, let's rethink this. They instead decided to increase production and their usage. Um, earlier this year, in early August, um, the EPA did do their list of top 23 high risk of uh, sterilizer facilities in the United States, and Laredo is on that list. And just to give you um, just an idea, looking at self-reported data by the company to the EPA, they opened in 2005, and um, we need to update this with 21 numbers that look similar to 2020 numbers, and again, this is all self-reported, um, but this company has released, you'll see on the far right column, um, many, many tens of thousands of pounds of uh, this um, carcinogen into the air every year. And you'll see in 2016, that's when the EPA reclassified ethylene oxide, but production really increased. To give you an idea of where we rank in the United States among a hundred other um, sterilizer plants, the graph on the left, this is all EPA data self-reported by these companies. Um, in 2019, we ranked second in the country. And you'll see on the right, 2020, uh, we ranked sixth. But if you look at the chart on the left, um, in Willowbrook, Illinois, it's an affluent com community outside of Chicago, also near an industrial kind of area, but their emissions were far less than what we have here in Laredo, and um, they, they did close it down, and there were a lot of factors that went into that from their community and their state. So to provide some perspective, so how toxic is that? Like, what do these numbers mean, right? Like these thousands of pounds and these rankings. So when um, trying to describe how toxic this chemical is to people, um, the reason Laredo is in those top, 20 tw top 23 facilities in the United States, it's because we are at a cancer risk level of one in a thousand. And what that means is that um, we are being exposed to about 11 parts per trillion. This is so minute, and yet it's so dangerous. So how do you get perspective on just what is one part per trillion? That's the equivalent of one drop of water in 20 Olympic-sized swimming pools, or one second in 32,000 years. Um, I was just gonna mention that other communities like Illinois they are really restricting their sterilizers to emit no more than 150 pounds a year. And even then, some places feel that that's too much. So we have work to do, obviously, and that's why we're working on this so hard. So um, the short term, it's uh, ETO, it's um, colorless, it's um, odorless for the most part. Um, and uh, the short term exposure is known to cause these problems to these sorts of organs um, and irritations. The long-term exposure, which is what we're worried about because of the volume of emissions um, since 2005, is that it really elevates the risks of cancer and particularly um, uh, cancers of the white blood cell, as well as breast cancer, but non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, myeloma, and acute uh, lymphocyte leukemia. And the reason why ethylene oxide is so dangerous, but why it's also so effective as a sterilizer is that it can penetrate through almost anything. And it's mutagenic, meaning it goes in and it can uh, 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 change the DNA in a cell. That's what gives it its very high cancer-causing uh, powers, if you will. So um, because of Council Member Perez and the City Health Department, um, they had to work really hard to get the state of Texas to begin doing these cancer cluster studies. Uh, and this took um, a lot of work, 
um, to say the least. And they finally came in and they did their first study looking at the first three census tracts. The middle one, um, this was cancer study one, that map. Um, and that's the census tract where Midwest is located. And that study was released um, on July 19th. And they found um, uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma at double the expected rate. And they call it statistically significant, meaning that it's higher than the rate that's expected for the rest of the state of Texas. And because this came out at that level, they decided to do the next three census tracts. I don't have the map of it, but it's in the report. That was released a few weeks ago, and they found uh, acute <coughs> lymphocytic le leukemia was, again, also double the expected rate, and then the cases of breast cancer were also statistically significant compared to the rest of the state. Um, so the work that we've done, because those that are impact, I, I, I forgot to put in the map so that from the EPA so that you could see how wide far-reaching uh, this chemical is in Laredo. It's not just confined to the Mines Road or Killam Industrial Park, although that's the area that's most directly impacted. Um, but it covers a very large part of the city. But in that sort of like um, specific area, um, it's businesses like yours that are very much impacted with the trade community because of your proximity to this plant and all of your workers are exposed at a very high level uh, day after day. So um, we tried to do some outreach and let have people become aware. So we visited 130 um, businesses in the KIPP, the Killam Industrial Park, um, because it's not that just that you're being directly impacted, but um, Midwest, what they are saying in a lot of their presentations without any sort of source to it is that the trade industry is responsible for ethylene oxide emissions. And there's nothing that proves that and they don't cite that, but you need to be aware of this. Um, and we're grateful to Mr. Prida. Um, in October, we had a very high level visit by the Region 6 Administrator as well as the Director of uh, Environmental Justice and Civil Rights from uh, Washington, D.C., Matthew Tejada, um, and Councilmember Perez, um, just to begin this conversation and answer questions that uh, somebody like Mr. Prida uh, can understand because of the membership of his group. Um, and so this was um, a meeting that we held back in October. So in terms of next steps, so um, because the TCEQ and Midwest have refused to do any sort of fence line air monitoring to get actual data and not have it be self-reported or be based off an equation. Uh, we've really worked the Clean Air Laredo Coalition with our local governmental entities to get their support. They've all joined the coalition through formal action and we've gotten the financial commitment uh, so far from Webb County, Laredo ISD and United ISD and the city um, at a past city council meeting has committed um, also uh, to, to, to help fund this initial fence line monitoring plan. And the idea is to use 100% of every single dollar in that pot um, to hire an experienced third party contractor to do the fence line air monitoring. And we're developing this plan with the EPA so that it has uh, the quality control, the QAQC, so that it's legitimate and valid, um, and we can share all of that data with everybody. And lastly, uh, we're here because we would like to meet. We know that uh, you, each of you represents a lot of people with your organizations. In your organization, a large um, membership. We believe it's vital that your members are aware of this so that we can do everything we can to protect your workers, our kids, our families, and take the appropriate steps um, together uh, with y'all as well. So we would like to be able to visit whenever you have your meetings through your organizations for us to do a presentation and answer whatever questions you might have. And our key people are Sheila and Lauro. That's she, uh, these can get uh, coordinated through them, but we really uh, believe it's vital that we 
have a chance to meet with all of you and your membership as well. Thank you for the presentation. I do have a question before I I'll let everybody else. The, 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 the funding and the timing for the, the fence line monitors, is, will that be implemented in quarter one, quarter two, quarter three of 2023, or yeah. is that still being developed? Uh, we are really hoping quarter one, but we need to go back to the city. I think we're planning to go back in January to show them kind of what we've been able to um, obtain and then fund the difference so that we can start quarter one is the goal to start it then. Okay, and, and I can give you an update on the city's part um, and LISD as well, because I've you know, talked to Mr. Oscar Perez, uh, one of the assistant superintendents for uh, LISD as well, and they've committed to $30,000 towards this effort. Uh, the city, uh, right off, I, I, I discussed with Dr. Chamberlain today, uh, because obviously she already reported to you uh, that uh, we did not get a grant that we applied for to help fund this. And so uh, during our budget presentation, uh, council gave us direction uh, to be a partner in this effort so the county had committed to 30,000, LISD committed to 30,000, UISD is still kind of out there. We're not sure where UISD is going to be, but if they were going to hop on to the 30,000, you know, number that's been kind of floated, we're hoping that they do, but I've already directed uh, Dr. Chamberlain to work with legal to draft an MOU directly with you all so you can initiate at, uh, the first hundred thousand dollars and that's going to happen pretty quickly we hope to take an item to the council the first uh, meeting in, in january and and that will be when the first hundred thousand is funded uh i'm encouraging you in the in, in the coalition uh to get an mou going with uh, lisd so because they're ready to go too i spoke to doctor uh to oscar perez yesterday Okay, so uh, they're ready to go with their 30, and I'm not sure, if we're, uh, I'm sure the county already said yes. yes. So if you get with Nathan Bratton to initiate that MOU on that side, mm -hmm. and we just have UISD kind of out there. And so um, I just told council member Bettis that uh, that's a direction I gave earlier to, to, to Dr. Chamberlain. So his office is already working with legal to, to, to get that, that document in order and we have time to put it in for January. That's the latest, okay? I just have a question. Uh, regarding the chemical itself, my understanding that Midwest uh, sterilizes medical devices and equipment, uh, and so if they're sterilizing these medical devices that go into the use in surgery and things like that, why has FDA not con uh, condemned this chemical as used as a sterilizer if it's so unsafe? If it's such a tremendous cancer-causing agent, why hasn't FDA taken up to saying you can't use this to sterilize equipment that's going into surgeries? And then why haven't all those surgical patients come up with cancer to boot? So my question is, are we attacking this from the right angle? If they're using it, they're using it because it's illegal to use. And if it's that dangerous of a chemical, why isn't it illegal? Yes, it's a very, very good question. And we have the same question too. And uh, things move very slowly with the federal government. And the EPA is expected in quarter one to issue a new rule um, uh, regarding commercial sterilizers and ethylene oxide. And it's taken them eight years. And there's been so many delays, but that's expected to happen in quarter one. On the FDA side, um, you know, uh, it, it take, they put a call out to industry to ask them to come up with alternatives to ethylene oxide as a sterilizer. The ISO, uh, International Standards uh, Organization, they just announced last week um, and they approved hydrogen peroxide as a, as a, as a valid and, and legitimate alternative as a commercial sterilizer. And um, not to say that that's gonna solve all the problems and it can 100% replace ethylene oxide. Um, so it just takes a long time with the federal agencies. It takes a really long time. And um, I also think what's happened is the industry, they've gone on a full out PR campaign to sort of blast the EPA science and minimize the risks. Um, and so they do that not just their individual companies, 
but like their industry trade group has been doing that as well. So um, I think it'll happen. It just is taking, it's happening very slowly. They also uh, lobby our politicians. Because yeah. I just love, I'm just thinking, my logic you know, is faulty sometimes, but I just think that if they're using it to sterilize medical equipment and it's that dangerous, it's concentrated on those pieces. Mm -hmm. What you're talking about with us is parts per trillion mm -hmm. that are dangerous to us, and it's one in 10,000 people are, can get, can possibly get cancer. Yes. Uh, it just seems if it's that dangerous, you would see so much more cancer cases where it's so much more concentrated in the use. Yes. And then you've got the people that work for the facilities. Yes. Are they coming up with cancer too? I don't know. Oh, we don't know yet. I know the health department is starting a voluntary um, I, what's it called? They're doing a voluntary community sort of health assessment to try to get more information about this. But, um, you know, uh, it's a very good question, Mr. Morris. And we have the same one as you do. And uh, we just wish things would move a lot faster than they're moving right now. They claim that it dissipates in 24 hours. So maybe it takes only 24 happen. hours to ship. Well, That's probably part of the reason. Yeah. Well, the, 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 the lifespan of, of the chemical, it's short, but it's still like dozens and dozens of days. And if you're putting it into the air at such high volumes, you know, that accumulates. It's a heavy, even though it's very small, it's a heavy molecule and it settles. It doesn't dissipate easily into the air. So it stays low to the ground. Uh, but um, I, you, know, you know, if I could interrupt, I, I've seen uh, you know some of the information publicized, and part of part of the answer I think Robert is it's continual exposure that's dangerous. It's not for you know an hour or a minute. Right. It's decades. Okay. Yes. And one more point, if I may, Council Member. Oh, Council gave us direction uh, just for to be transparent uh, to work with the EPA and with the other agencies to make sure that the plan of analysis, how they were gonna analyze and sample was within approvable parameters. They wanted it to be scientific. Uh, I read some emails where the state is literally almost saying, or the, the people that are looking at this are like almost saying that they're not ready to bless it per se, Trish. And, or, but, and so if that may be a hang up with a council when we bring the item back, that, that the scientific method may not be fully approved. So it won't be a matter of us as a city holding back because we're ready to move forward. But council made it very clear that they didn't want to just, here's a hundred thousand or whatever the balance is. And then all of a sudden we don't have a scientific method and what are, it are, it's what we're doing effective. If what we're doing really measuring because of the small trillion that we're talking about here, is it even gonna be measurable with what's out there to measure? And so that's been something that needs to be worked out completely. Bef I mean, we'll be ready with the agenda item, so uh, it's gonna come down to that. I'd like hey, to, uh, please. I, I see you standing there. I, yeah. I think you'd like to make a comment. Well, I just want to make two, two comments, like, well, a few comments. But uh, number one, so to going back to your question, Mr. Morris, is this, is this is not the only chemical that you can use to sterilize the actual medical equipment that the doctors use to perform their surgeries and everything, because a lot of those are stainless steel, right? Uh, the problem here is that this is kind of like the business model that they have, that they package these these things up with their partner companies and they sterilize everything all together in one blast. So they're sterilizing paper and, and, and other <coughs> things that are not necessarily the medical equipment and, 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 and they're per se, but you know, and then their and their argument is well, you know, it's it's easier to, to have it all sterilized in one blast and things like that. But as far as like people, you know, going into surgery and and and, and using equipment that's not sterilized. I mean, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about, of course, we want sterilized medical equipment, but the question is, is this the right way to go when there's, it's a known carcinogen. It's kind of what happened with Roundup. You know, they were using it for years and then they knew that it caused cancer and then they 
stopped using it, you know, and going back to Trisha's reference to the stop sterogenics uh, in Illinois, I don't know if you all followed the news, but about two weeks ago, uh, there's been a lot of lawsuits against that company that was there because they were there for over 40 years and there was a lot of cancer in that community and uh, a, a woman won like a $300 million judgment uh, for her breast cancer case uh, against this company. So, uh, and not to say like, oh, that's gonna happen here, but my point is is that it there was, had to have been something there that they deemed that there was strong enough cause to show that this chemical more than likely, you know, caused her, her breast cancer and her suffering. And so this plant in Laredo has only, hasn't been here 20 years, but you know, that community had that plant for 40 and we don't want Laredo to end up where every house you go to, there's at least one or two people with cancer. And then and they these, decide to take action. Yeah. And, and then by then it's too late. And so all these uh, clus uh, cancer cluster studies that we asked for the data, um, at first we were told <coughs> yes, and then we were told no. And then we had to get, you know, state representatives involved to push for them to actually release the data. And if you look across all the cancers, even though some of the cancers are statistically significantly higher, the incident rates for all the cancers are still higher than what the state expects for us to have. And so that's alarming you know, and we can't ignore that. You know, as a community, we can't ignore that. If there's something happening, we need to figure out what's going on for the safety of our people. So I guess that's what we're at. And I just wanted to add, Ms. Morris. So, Midwest, compared to all the other sterilizers, their usage rate is excessive. The amount that they use for the, uh, is, is, is significantly higher than the amount of ethylene oxide that other sterilizers use. So they just like overly use like this chemical in their process. Maybe that's something that could be looked at to minimize that. There's all, you know, we, we really hope we can find a solution to this um, that makes sense and that keeps, that keeps everybody here safe. And, uh, you know, Laredo's so medically underserved that the 10 years that they looked at for these two cancer cluster studies, we know that because we're so medically underserved that that's not even an accurate, probably, it's not an accurate true count of cases either. And yeah, we don't we don't want to have to wait till we have all these cancer clusters popping up before we do something about it. Please don't misunderstand. I'm not <coughs> opposed to the idea. I just don't understand if it's so dangerous. How can even FDA allow it to be done? And how can I mean because they're medical devices, the doctors, and why are the doctors even allowing it to be done? Because the doctors have a big say in insisting, hey, I can't have my patients under these circumstances. And, and you mentioned. Uh, medical devices and the volume. I know that um, a big medical device producer is in Nuevo Laredo and they bring in millions of, of kits. Um, it's amazing how much volume that they produce and bring over. So it's just that sheer volume might suggest why they're using so much of that chemical. But again, it's not that I'm opposed to the idea. Certainly in the long run, I want to make sure that our community doesn't have a, a cancer or a case like you mentioned where 40 years later they take action. That's not, that's not what I'm after. I'm just asking the questions of if it's so dangerous, why don't even the doctors, and more importantly, the FDA say, you can't use this because they won't let stuff into the country if it's had that stuff, I mean, if it's dangerous. I mean, they're very, I mean, I'm, we import stuff that FDA oversees, and they're so strict on things that it's, it's unbelievable to me that they wouldn't have a say in this. I, I would like to say something. Our government has done illegal studies on minority communities. Our government has done terrible acts against humankind, people here, black, white, it doesn't matter. It has happened here, okay? We cannot trust our government, okay? We have to enforce or find a way for them to enforce, and it's up to us because the government is not taking care of us. So I'm going to make a couple of comments. Trisha, as you know, I'm a supporter of sustainability and, and obviously uh, Medline used to sit on our board previously, so being open about that. And I've toured their facility and, you know, I think it's a state-of-the-art facility. Um, as you mentioned, the, the medical kits that they produce are for hospitals here locally and, and in the region, and they have a 
the sister plant in order to be preaching at the choir here, you all know that. And in that conversation, um, the whole component of triple bottom line comes to mind, right? When we talk about sustainability, we want to push it forward as, as much as I do as well. We want to make sure that it's serving the businesses and the communities and everybody going forward. And so I'm supportive of, you know, holding them accountable. But then this kind of, for me, puts it in a little slippery slope, right? We're going to the air, which is we're not in a non-attainment. We don't have anybody around for 150 miles. So that's why sometimes it can be a little bit... Uh, lofty for people right but it is a it is it's very deadly and or very cancer causing and so what what leads me to think is you know there's a lot of emissions put out by vehicles uh, you know when we have a lot of queuing a lot of the bridge delays mm -hmm. so that adds to the whole air quality component and it might not i feel it's just singling out one company understandably they're doing something but there's a lot of companies and then there's been a lot that we put into our ground that goes into our water as, as you are aware of that and so I'm totally supportive of this. I just want to make sure that we're, what we're going towards is providing solutions and not just shutting down, right? Are, are we creating a, a mechanism where we're adding these APUs or, or you know, the accessory uh, APUs, the, the power units on the back of the truck, so that way if they're parked somewhere, they don't have to be idling, they can be electric. Trying to provide more options on the, the transition as opposed to just, just the stick, right? The carrot and the stick. And so... I'm supportive of it. I definitely think that's great to keep the, the fence line monitoring. Maybe we can incorporate some of the high schools or you know, put, uh, our engineering teams and create something locally, but also hire that third party so that we can continue to grow those efforts. And just in that same vein, it's, I'm an urban planner by trade, and so if, if this is such a continuously producing plant, you know, I don't think we should open the school that's about to open over there, you know, continually the, the homes in that area. As we know, there's, there's a lot of development going in that area, and so it, it's a it's a slippery slope, but I definitely agree that now is the time, right? There's no reason to wait to tell the community that this is happening. I think this is important, and sometimes these things hurt to talk about, right? But we need to. We, I, I completely agree, and so I applaud you and the group for doing that. It's a tough. I know. Thank you. And I, just the last thing I wanted to mention. So the and I, I wish I would have added it, and I didn't. But it's the EPA cancer level risk map for Laredo. And you know we're at the highest level in the country, 95 to 100 percent. The risk is higher, and you, if you live in this area, than from industrial air pollution than other parts of the country. And then there's like sections that are uh, 90 to 95, and then 85 to 90. And that map, it when it when EPA looked at all the sources, it zeroed in on this one stationary plant that it is being, that this cancer level, very elevated cancer level risk in Laredo is coming from this one stationary plant, this one facility. And so we need to do everything we can to make sure that those emissions really, really come down uh, and that there is transparency and that there's fence line air monitoring. We're having to pick up the tab, the taxpayers are, for something that this company should be required to do in, in the spirit of transparency and being a good corporate citizen that's providing a, a, a very important service, but that at the same time is endangering the health of so many people and especially kids that are specific, that are especially susceptible and vulnerable to this mutagenic air toxic. One recommendation. Um, can you please go back uh, two slides or just uh, another one? Another one, please. No, the one that. Uh, the, no, back, back, please. No, the, the chart. The next one, next one, here. It says Midwest Sterilization Laredo, Texas. They have a Midwest Sterilization in Jackson. What we could do is make them do the production up there and go make this go down. Because as, as you're telling, here is the pollution really, really concentrated. Why don't they just go and put up their production down there and do less production here? Because the fence line would be not, uh, it's not going to be uh, any, any solution. We're just going to measure and see how's the pollution getting worse or worse, but it's, it's, it's no solution to the problem. Yes. So in, in Jackson, it's uh, a bit less their volume, but they've invested hundreds of millions of more dollars into that plant for, um, for emissions control. 
and they've said they're gonna do it in Laredo and that they're working on it, but they won't give a timeline and they've definitely said they will not do air monitoring to show if it's controlling those emissions, which is why we want to do it. At least now, as uh, Chief Landin said, we need to get like at least a baseline data so that when they come in and say, okay, we put in pollution controls, we can come in and see if that's, if that's, if there is, if we see a difference. And the baseline data you have, uh, do you have like an actual footprint where all the pollution is going or? With the front line, you'll get like better measurements. With fence line. And yes, and the reason why it's tricky is because the EPA only has one approved, one major approved method for doing air monitoring, but it only measures in parts per million. And so releases that are smaller than that in the parts per trillion, those, uh, those methods, it's very hard to capture. So. We want to do the EPA approved method and, and that's going to happen, you know, they're going to, they're reviewing the plan, but we also want to uh, try to uh, look at some of these other developing technologies that can also start to measure in the parts per trillion range because that's what we need to, that's what we need to have. And the actual uh, uh, footprint goes to the whole city or just the Kiram okay. section? More, more in that more immediate area. Yeah, so, so two things and we probably ought to move on. Uh, thank you for the presentation, but you mentioned the map and maybe you wanted to include that yep. in the presentation. Maybe you can send that to uh, Ms. Limon and she can distribute it to, to, uh, to the, the okay. committee members. Definitely. Um, the, the second thing, I know you had an ask and, and I think it's reasonable uh, for those of, the, uh, of us that have organizations and, and, and presentations and memberships, whatnot, um, if, if you would consider uh, having uh, having a presentation and some awareness given uh, to the community through through our organizations as well. I attended the Laredo Rotary Club meeting that had a presentation from uh, from Ms. Cortez and, and uh, now Councilwoman Segueroa, uh, and, and they also uh, had invited uh, representatives from Midwest Sterilization, and it, it got a little interesting, um, but it was respectful. Uh, but uh, um, it, uh, I just say it was it was interesting. Normally, the Laredo Rotary Clubs are very, very positive and congratulatory and good news <laughs> stories. But uh, you broke some new ground there, so congratulations for that as well. To answer Guillermo's question, historically, these companies that move into cities to poison them, they move to minority communities. That plant over there is a white community, so of course they're going to do things differently. But that is not right. You know, so they won't do that because of that. You know, it'd be so, it's a simple solution. I love that sort of, but they won't do it because of that. So that, that's why they brought it to Laredo because we're 95% minorities. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would like to recognize uh, Arturo Dominguez who uh, joined us. Thank you. Sorry, sorry for being tardy. We were at a meeting uh, in Nuevo Laredo with the or director at the state and the federal level to see the expansion. No, no problem, we got you covered. Um, we do have another presentation and so I'd like to move on. Oh, I'm sorry, yes, I, uh, Carlos Fernandez as well. Thank you, thank you. My, my head didn't turn that far to the left. Uh, you, you're counted as present. We do have another presentation to go through in the, in the, the spirit of time. And for those that, that know me, I'd like to start on time and, and end on time. Uh, but it is important. Um, item five, section two, discussion with possible action to propose a pilot program to decongest FM 1472 Mines Road on weekdays during peak hours, 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. and any other matters incident thereto. Do we have a presentation for this topic? I think it was just discussion on this and bringing ideas to to the to the committee. Um, I, I brought my own in writing. I, I like to go over them. One and foremost is synchronizing the uh, the uh, traffic light. the traffic light on Mines Road, especially coming from Columbia to Laredo. I think we need to synchronize them better. In other words, during peak hours to extend the green light. 
even if the ones coming from the artery to make a right turn and then you do U-turns wherever they want to, but I think we have to work with that. The other one is if the traffic is still in excessive traffic, I think we have to bring in the police officer and manually control traffic. I mean, getting down of the, of the police car, not just sitting there and just having the lights on, but actually going to the street and, and, and moving the traffic uh, the decongestion. The other one is sending everything that crosses through Colombia through the Camino Colombia, all the way to 83, Botines, and then come down, and, and then you can go where you have to. That would be another option. The other one is doing a traffic route, like we used to have when, when they were crossed through, through Bridge 2. It was just 35 straight, no, nobody <laughs> coming in through any streets. It was just going straight, and, and you had to do a line. So we're looking at going on Killam towards 35, that's a couple of miles, and then making a right turn on the access road of 35, and then getting loop 20, the access road, and leading into to the bridge, and that would be the traffic route. That's approximately, or exactly 5.3 miles of line. Other than that, you would have to go back to Colombia and keep the line over there, when the, when, especially when the system is down. The Mexican system is down. We, we have to look for a control. It's getting out of hand. People are taking a couple of hours just to get from Colombia to Laredo, and especially the people that live in that area. And the last proposal is to increase the toll fees on the bridge during the peak hours. And so you'll spread the traffic during the day. And those are my two seconds. Oh, well, those are my ideas, yeah. Si tienes una mejor idea, pues échale. Este, no, no. Bien, coincido con, con, con el punto de que es un lugar donde puede haber áreas de oportunidades de mejora. Eso. Más sin embargo, proponer las, las acciones está fuera de mi alcance. Eh, lo dije en broma cuando hablas como solución incrementar el costo de algo pero bueno, pues, tal vez funcionaría más sin embargo creo que debe, estoy seguro porque he pasado en, en estas horas y otras horas y se ven áreas de oportunidad pero mi propuesta sería que gente, personas especialistas en, en el tráfico hagan el, el estudio, la investigación y que ellos sean los que nos propongan qué es lo que, que ellos sean los que propongan qué acciones se podrían tomar para descongestionar el tráfico en esa en esa sección. Son, son no nada más ideas. Digo, no, no, thank you, Arturo. I, mean, I, I wrote right down here. five things: synchronized lights, police directing traffic, send Columbia traffic to 255. Yeah, oh, you have, have a list. And, and so I, I would recommend we pass this to uh, the bridge department and Ms. Lemon and city management to see uh, if, if any of these items, one at a time, that's how you, that's how you, you eat an elephant, right? And uh, and see which of these items uh, could be passed on to the appropriate departments, whether it's the police department, the bridge department, uh, text dot, um, et cetera, et cetera. Everybody so, involved, yeah. and, and I mean, they could be pilot programs. They, they don't have to be permanent either. It's just- So I'll ideas. accept the document and I'll pass it on to, to our liaison and the city manager. Thank you. Thank Any you. other discussion or, Can, yeah, or, or ideas the, on the same yeah, topic? There's uh, an, another option for that. Uh, for the traffic lights, uh, we can use uh, cameras that uh, have uh, artificial intelligence to sense the traffic, and it will automatically put the red and green lights. It it, 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 it will depend, and they will work uh, <clears throat> with the traffic uh, at the time being, uh, and not like just let's say like a time frame that they're putting here uh, between two and five. If we move on to this artificial in intelligence, it will work 24-7. Uh, and, and, and on that light, I, I've been to Washington, D.C. My daughter used to live there. And, and, and maybe it, it, it's in other big cities as well that has a lot of traffic. Giving on the freeway, on the on-ramp, yeah. there, there's a red light or green light, and it, and it, right. it meters the amount of traffic on, on the beltway yeah. and, and whatnot. That's correct. And, uh, 
so something to consider. That would be a solution uh, and a quick one, and if it's implemented, uh, they can use it in that spot and uh, in, in other places that, uh, that have uh, heavier traffic, they can move on and put the Boy, that's on the list. Yep. Uh, Mr. Morris. Um, I think Arturo mentioned it briefly about uh, something to do with the police control of it, directing traffic. Real but, intelligence. Sorry? Real intelligence. The real intelligence is correct. <laughs> but the idea is that if you go down Mines Road right now, you're going to see police cars stop with their lights flashing at almost every intersection. And I'm not sure what they're doing. Uh, sometimes they're blocking the road so they can't turn right in a certain way or whatever, but or they can't come straight. But maybe we could utilize our resources better by putting up barricades so that the trucks can't go by there instead of having a, a manned police officer sitting there for hours and hours and hours getting paid. Um, and then maybe using those to come in and actually direct traffic at some of these intersections during the peak hours. Um, that's just a, a thought that I have, that we would, if you have the resources that are already there, let's put them to work and, and instead of just sitting there. Because I think we're paying them to be there, right? Yes. <coughs> Please. Good evening. Uh, Assistant Chief Manuel Maciel uh, for the Little Rick Police Department. And, and you're right, officers are there. Uh, some of the tra traffic directing strategies is the use of the police car, obviously for the protection of the officer and to direct the traffic from certain lanes. Uh, but just from, from the last time I was here, uh, we did discuss about the, the program that we were gonna do combined with the bridge to have officers uh, specifically during this uh, um, heavy time periods. Uh, the, the main thing is the, the volume, the sheer volume. So how we do that is managing these vital intersections, manning uh, those, uh, using the, the controls for the lights, uh, understanding that it's a text dot uh, property Road. Road. roads. Mm -hmm. uh, so just in when we began early October, uh, we've had we've used about 506 man hours of just traffic control. So uh, that's averaging about eight police officers during the day, during the peak hours, one which camera, I think. Uh, from two to about midnight, uh, with uh, three to eight o'clock being the main peak time. Uh, sometimes it's relatively flowing, and uh, sometimes it is, it is heavy. Uh, but for the most part, we are there, and, and we are doing the best as we can. Uh, I think what you're probably one of the recommendations about having a, a, a consultant or a professional company may offer some solutions, uh, but considering that it's a textile road, maybe we should look into it textile also. They're here, we should be, right? They didn't show, I mean, I work there during the day. So <laughs> I, sit there, I sit there in the daytime. <laughs> what I was gonna say is we, we partner with, just in regards to the studies, uh, we. Partner with TTI, Texas Transportation Institute, that does, I, I call them, they're our nerds of our team. And they're a different entity, but they do all our heavy lifting. They're all the PhDs and all, they run the models and the simulations. Uh, just most recently, what we've been doing is we partnered with these three data companies. And so a lot of this goes by modeling, right? They, how much traffic you got, how much came through a bridge. Now we're gonna go based off of cell phone data. Um, these new, these technologies that we're adopting or partnering with will be using location-based information. So we're doing origin and destination studies and finding out the times of day, where they're going, where they're going, where they're coming from. And so all of this has just recently happened uh, within the past two, three weeks that we've partnered, got them on board. And so we'll be getting to, beginning to explore that data and as well as sharing that with our local partners, which would be the MPO, uh, Metropolitan Planning Organization for the region, as well as Texas will have that. So, one, that component of 1472 from I-69 to Pan American, there's a, an additional study that's going in to see where do we add the overpasses, if they're gonna come through, or what innovative ways that we do uh, to the intersections. One of the ones that y'all are familiar with was uh, Killam Road left turn lane, and then the right turn lane to go north. Caused a lot of disruptions. It changed the way that we're gonna be implementing projects there, right? We don't want to happen during the daytime. We heard, we heard the industry loud and clear, um, so we'll be changing that. I don't, I'm not saying for all of them, but they're, they're taking it into account and they want to push that with every contractor, keeping in mind that section. Beyond Pan American, there's not really a lot, but we have right of way to widen there, and so we've talked about potentially adding another lane on the interior. Um, 
really just working within our right of way. We're not trying to acquire any more, but from 69 to Pan American, there's option to add lanes and widen them. So that's where we're at right now. TTI has a few more. Um, they got a couple more weeks on the other studies that they're doing, but that's beyond that section. I know. The, the road belongs to TxDOT, but who controls the lights is the city of Laredo. No, TxDOT. Well, in, in court, the city, the city, the, 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 the traffic lights. Because I saw Mr. Murillo just right behind his desk. He could see all the cameras when they call him that it's clogged, and he would see that it was moving. And it was it was just a, a false call. But he can he he actually would change the timing of any street light. That's what he told me yeah, when he uh, was back there. To my knowledge, uh, you may be right, but from to my knowledge, I think it's text dot. The, yeah, you're right. Absolutely, the roadway is ours, but the signalization, with, since it's in within the city, the city limits, limits, the traffic uh, manages the, the signalization and, and the timing. Yes, I, I got a picture a little while ago, and and, the, and it shows that he's just parked, looking at his phone there in Mines Road, and and and. Okay. And, and kill them. And that's what they're saying is, yes, they're there, they're present, but they're not directing traffic. I think if they would have direct traffic, it would the, the, the traffic would flow better at that period. I didn't understand the statement about the control of the lights. Uh, in every city that I've been to, so I've seen police officers, city police officers that control the lights. You see them at the arena events all the time doing that in, in the big cities. Uh, I, don't, I thought they were doing that here because there was a time when the traffic was just flowing like glory. And, and then and I saw him, and even, you know, I live out there, and I saw one that was there in the intersection that I come out of, and the officer was actively engaged in the traffic, making sure they didn't block intersections, letting those through when they, it was nice. But then that happened for like maybe three or four days, and then all of a sudden all we see is people parked in their cars, and, and the traffic is back to where it was. And, and, and my knowledge, or my, the perspective that I get, and my perspective can be wrong, I acknowledge, is that we're paying them and they're not doing their job. So, so when if, we see if the perspective is wrong, then help you change it. When we see a, a, a police car park, you kind of just lower the speed limit. That's that's really what you control the speed. But here they're they don't they're not moving. That's that's the issue here. They they don't move. Just my little roadway when the system, the Mexican system is down, just that my little road coming into mine's road. I mean, you could take seven lights just to go through that street, and that's really what frustrates the people in that area. It's just traveling a couple of blocks; it'll take a couple of hours, and that's that's. You make a note of that. <laughs> that's that's not tolerable. We, I think we mentioned last time having a special route for non-commercial traffic during these heavy times. What would prohibit us from having just a special lane during the peak hours that? You know, like in some of the major cities, when you go through, truck drivers can't drive in a certain lane, on the inside lane generally. Could we not have something like that here in, in, uh, during Mines Road during those peak hours that truck drivers are not allowed in, and that way the non-commercial folks can get in out of their, their homes and get to and from where they need to go? Uh, dynamic uh, lane? Asking. You're talking about like dynamic lanes where, you know, only cars could use this lane yeah. during these hours, maybe during those hours, right? Yeah. And that way we have a clear lane of passage. Yep. Well, I'd like to add to that because I had a town hall in my district and we brought everybody together and TxDOT explained that because of the because of it being an FM road, there's really, it's not feasible to do that because trucks are going off and on the road on both sides throughout the whole way. So they do that more for like an interstate highway or a different classification of road. They don't really do that for an, for an FM road and that's what they were explained to us and Jason would know more. but. The reason why um, I think this item had the times here is because these are the times when people, the children, are, are coming out of school. This is the times when there's a lot of school buses. Um, there's a lot of people that are trying to get in and out of their home. And this happens to be the peak time when a lot of the trucks for the industry are also getting ready to. So you have all this like demand on the roadway all at the same time. And I think the intention with this item is to try to find a way to live together, if you will, because you know you guys are trying to work, and then there's people out there that are trying to live, and um, you know we could say, well, you shouldn't have bought in an industrial area all day, and the city. we could go back and forth, but we've been doing that for years, and it hasn't worked. We've been asking for money for roads, and we're not getting the money. 
So now we have to work with what we have, and what we have is a roadway that's very congested at certain times of the day. And we're trying as best as we can with TxDOT, you know, to, to make changes, but uh, the changes are causing problems also because they're, you know, shutting down lanes while they're widening them. And so that there's, we, we really have a mess out there. So um, the idea was to try to um, see what we can do to clear some of the, the, the trucks off the roadway for a little bit of the day when people are trying to get to, to and from. Uh, so that way they can, um, you know, like go, go home, you know, they can get to school. The kids are not trapped in school buses uh, for long periods of time and things like this. And then we can resume the, the trade activity, you know, after that. So I think that's what we were, the, the, what I'm seeing here is that there's a need for some working together. And I did speak to um, certain people in, in the industry about like, well, and one suggestion that came up, and I don't think management's gonna wanna hear this. Mr. Lundin, cover your ears. Uh, <laughs> was uh, possibly, you know, making it cheaper to go through Columbia during these peak times so that they could go that way. Because what I understood is to go through World Trade is let's say $25 but to go through Columbia is $35 because of the extra gas and everything like that. But if the fares for the bridge crossing was lower, then it would offset some of that extra cost for them and then they would utilize that route more. So, and because it would be faster. And so these are kind of like the, <coughs> we're gonna end up paying an increased police or we're gonna end up paying in you know, decreased revenue, it's gonna, but at least it would take congestion off of the mines road during these peak hours and it would help the industry utilize Columbia a little bit better and maybe that would help everybody. So I think that we could maybe talk about something like that as far as like, a, you know, how feasible it is looking at the numbers and things and, and seeing if that would work. But uh, another suggestion that I was, um, that came up was uh, people, the trucks are trying to get on from Mines Road and from I-69 all to the bridge, World Trade, and they're like fighting with each other to get in. And then the people that have been in line forever on I-69 are mad because the people on Mines Road are like cutting in. So what I was thinking, uh, police, maybe we could eliminate the uh, option of going from Mines Road onto there and make everybody have to get in line through uh, I-35 I I or I-69. And I don't know what, I'm throwing that out there for you guys to chew on that one. But I, I think that would help because the trucks wouldn't back up on Mines Road. I was gonna make a few comments. I mentioned there's a couple of these solutions to some of them the text on and some to myself and the mayor. But um, <laughs> so the emergency situation, the reason this one came up, when the Mexican side shuts down, Mines Road clogs up, as we all know. It backs up going north from 69 up towards Killam that the Faskin family owns that northwest corner right there when you make the right to go onto I-69 to get onto the board. Mm -hmm. We had just discussed, maybe it's not there or another facility, but having a, a storage yard, an emergency storage yard to clear one lane of Mines Road when the bridge shuts down. So when it all backs up, you say, police comes over, says, maybe it's not the dynamic lanes, right? But the police says, inside lane, everybody <clears throat> get into this yard and they're in a queue and then, I talked to Ms. Limon that we have to create another entrance at the World Trade Bridge to allow for Milo Road to go into that property, into the bridge section, so you don't have that crossing of, or that mixing between jockeying for position. And so that gives us at least a solution where maybe it's the Port of Entry Committee or the, the bridge team that owns a piece of land or leases it to have that emergency storage yard when the bridge does shut down to give PD a place to you know, collect and, and reconvene but it gives us a space to operate as well as a location to be able to move stuff. And the reason this came up, they came to us because they were gonna develop it. And so it's, it's already met the plat and all that stuff, all the process, but I just asked them, I said, would you guys be open to the suggestion? And they said, well, if, if this is something Textile wants to do, this is something the city wants to do. And I said, look, I'm gonna mention it. I, I don't have any money. And Textile says they're not gonna buy it. It has to be a partnership and so that was one of the ideas we discussed was potentially having a, an emergency storage yard for incidents that happen. And I think that, I mean, that's doable, right? Or now we do a truck parking yard outside in those industrial parks and let you do a queuing system, right? You call in 
You say, hey, I'm gonna cross some bridge, and they give you a time. I think Arturo's mentioned that several times. They used to do it in the past where you all had a ticket, and everybody knew what time you were gonna cross, and so. But they also have property that cannot be developed. It's kind of not flat, so they, they can't develop anything there, and that could be parking space. And, and I had already mentioned to, to Orly, or Ortiz, Orly Ortiz, and, and, and he was gonna look into it, but he never brought he never brought it back. No, it's the. Uh, you're talking about Rodeo with Killam. Rodeo with Killam. This is a Baskin property. Oh, this is a Baskin. Oh. The Mr. Ceballos can. can I mean, I mentioned it to it. Jose at the at the meeting. I've mentioned it to Carolyn Mays from TechStock with their freight division, and so they were supportive of it. But again, TechStock said. We're not into the business of buying property if we're not going to put a road on it. Right? Or managing either. Correct. Because <laughs> somebody but has to clean it. <laughs> what I told them was that we need to offer our services in the freight industry and our, our nerds on the team to look at this. And we said we would help out in whatever, whatever design, if we have to incorporate technology for the communication. That was something that we were willing to work towards. But, you know, this had to be a, a city-led effort. It's almost like we need to have a workshop on this topic. Uh, we have so many ideas uh, in... in uh, I think we ought to think about that. You know, it might it, it might be a whole afternoon. Oh yeah, a workshop, right? And so and so let's consider that. Uh, you know, maybe obviously we're already feeling like it's January, uh, but uh, maybe sometime in January we, we get a, uh, our committee together and uh, we start kicking around ideas and, and and ranking them and scoring them and then for those that rise to the top, maybe we can have some 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 action item owners. <coughs> Even if it, we have to reach out to Tech Stop, Police Department, Bridge Department, um, landowners, I would suggest that. Uh, we have a few more minutes left, and in, in, uh, I hate to I hate to cut everybody off, but I think we have one more topic uh, that we'd like to get an update on the liquid disposal and the surveys and any updates, Mr. Porter. Hi, good evening, uh, John Porter, Environmental and Solid Waste uh, Director. Uh, I'll, I'll be very brief, uh, but if, if the committee would like uh, an, a more in-depth discussion next time, um, you know, I can, I can come back and we can discuss the, the issue more in-depth. And sorry to interrupt you, right from the very beginning, we probably need to extend the meeting. Uh, motion to extend to half an hour if needed. Second. So all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Sorry for the interruption. No problem. Uh, so we, we did receive 17 uh, responses to the liquid waste uh, questionnaire. And I'm bringing it up so I can show the committee where you can find it. Um, it's right here, this green label. Uh, so if you haven't filled this out and you do have liquid waste, uh, please fill it out. Uh, it will help. Um, I think we could probably do an event sometime uh, January, February. Again, we need to know what what the waste is, what the quantity is, um, and then that way we can set up. What you, you have to do a uh, universal waste um, application, which we'll send out. But uh, based on the 17 that we received, the bulk, 99.65 percent of what was submitted, is is hazardous. We, we, we can't take this. This is hazardous. Um, and uh, Ponderosa can't take hazardous and the city can't take hazardous. So if there's a DOT um, placard or hazard sticker on that product or it's on the MSDS, it's a good idea that we, we can't take that. And so you, you're gonna have to take that to a hazardous waste uh, disposal facility. Um, Robstown is probably the closest. But, um, you know, we're still on schedule to, to host an event. Um, but again, I, I need something that that I can legally accept. Uh, I did get an email today. Somebody wanted to get rid of milk. I need to find out, is that liquid milk? Is it powdered milk? If it's powdered milk, it can be landfilled. Um, it still may need to be a special waste, but you know, as long as it's solidified and it's not hazardous, we can take it at the regular landfill. Due to a color, it's a liquid, and it has a red color. And, it's and it's they liquid can import it, okay. and it, it's going to get expired, so they have to dispose of it. So yeah, when, once we once we get uh, a decent amount, so that 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 one was uh, a, a a fair amount. But then on the other um, on the other products that were listed, um, they're just <coughs> in a high volume. There were there was a couple that said I don't have any liquids now, 
but I'm interested in, in the future. So again, um, you know, tell, tell your friends, tell your family, or whoever to, to fill out the survey. That really is going to help us out a lot. And then once we go through that, we'll we'll work individually with with everybody. Um, and does uh, Mr. Porter does, does the survey allow for contact information to be given? Does that initiate potentially a conversation? For, so uh, for I'll, a I'll show you right event? now, it, it's your email uh, and your contact name, and then I, I get a copy of it uh, through a like an Excel. And then I can just email you or, or call you. So that can initiate a, a conversation about an event or pick up as yeah. well. Okay. And, and, you know, on something that, that we can definitely take, you know, I may have to ask for if, if there is uh, an MSDS, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. Or if it's, you know, again, a food product, um, I think it's, it's safe. And, and so we'll send out that universal waste um, form, which needs to be filled out. Uh, because we, we just need to keep keep a record of what we're accepting. I have a question. So if you only have a few cases, do you still need the bulldozers and all that stuff there? You know, if it's a few cases, no. Uh, uh, and, you know, we could work something out there. I, I was going to say, I, I kind of, I, I, I don't, don't quote me on this, but, you know, if it, if it was a pallet, a small pallet, we can work that into our, our waste stream at the landfill with mulch or something to, to solidify it. But it's the, you know, I've got eight truckloads of this. Well, I, oh, that, 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 I, 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 we're going to have to take that and solidify it. But, but yeah. I mean, can you, would you open like Ponderosa to like once a month just to dispose a few boxes, whatever, and then you come later with a thing or it has to be run through the machinery when, when you throw it there? I, you know, I mean, if that's something that works for you, I'm going to get rid of a pallet uh, one at a time, I'm, and that that works for me. I don't have to go and open up Ponderosa to do that. Um, it just depends on how many pallets you're trying to get rid of. But if, if you can bring that, you know, a pallet once a week, and then you're done at the end of three weeks, then, you know, that, that I think is easier. I don't have to move personnel and equipment over to Ponderosa. We can just handle that at the regular landfill. I, I think that's very helpful, right? I think we were, we, we weren't aware of that a month ago or two months ago. And so if you provided that flexibility. Yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, I, mean I, I, think, I think we can do that. Um, but you said don't quote you. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I don't want everybody, you know, showing up, uh, right. you know, and then, then everybody's trying to get rid of a pallet and then, then that comes into, you know, be, becomes a problem. But, I, I think if we work it case by case, um, you know, we can work something out. Uh, but yeah, on, on very large quantities, uh, multiple truckloads, yeah, we're going to have to use the the Ponderosa side. But I think that's progress too, right? The, the, you know, a month or two ago, Ponder as far as we as far as we understood, Ponderosa was closed until further notice. It 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 is the the idea is if we get a, uh, a large enough uh, it doesn't have to be a large enough group of people. It just needs to be a large enough quantity so that I can justify the rental of equipment to take out there. Then I can move some personnel out there and then we'll do it. We'll do it by appointment. So, you know, if, if there's 10 people that need to get rid of stuff, we'll stagger that out. And, um, and then that way we can do the mixing. Um, but yeah, I, I, I can't, I can't just open it and, and, and hope somebody shows up that day. Oh, no, 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 no. We would never do that. And we know it, it, it costs $7,500 a day just to have the yeah. personnel there. So we're aware of that. We just want somewhere we could dump it and that you don't have to have the machinery there. You can probably bring it once a quarter and just pass it over everything that we dumped there. I mean, it, that's it's just so we understand what the process sounds like. And, and, so we have a better understanding, but that we can, that we don't have to pay an extra freight to send it somewhere else uh, to dispose of it, or throwing it in ranches or things like that. I mean, we, that's the last thing we would want to do to dispose of something. And and then also I should bring this up. I mean, we are limited <coughs> at, at processing. Um, it's about nine thousand gallons per per load. Uh, we have concrete lined mixing bins. Uh, so we'll mix dirt with it to solidify it, but those those three bins can can hold a maximum of, of nine thousand gallons. So so keep that in mind. Oh, 
Any other questions, comments? I just want to say that's good news to know that there's uh, options now. I represent the rental license customs brokers, and so we get more merchandise that comes in that's refused generally by FDA, but other stuff too. And we have no way to, we can't re export it back to Mexico. We can't destroy it anywhere. And we're stuck holding it in our warehouses forever. Uh, a big part of the problem that started a lot of this conversation was hand sanitizer, which um, you've just informed us for sure can't go there. Um, and I think part of us were under the understanding that Ponderosa was hazmat and could do liquids. And oh, no, no, so, no. but if that's the case, then we're good there. But there's still also the other products that, uh, just different things that are liquids that have wrong food colorings or food colorings that don't meet certain certifications and, and they have to be destroyed and there's no place to do that. Uh, and the nature of the cost of the products and then transporting it to some place like Robstown and all that is, is so cost prohibitive that it's, it's not funny. So this at least having some options that we can work with, and we won't quote you on things, but we might give you a call and say, can we do this, and, and we'll help us out. Yeah, no, and, and, and again, I mean, I, I, wanna, I wanna have a solution, um, but it's, it's just, yeah, it's, 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 it's economics. You know, once you, once you get behind the volume, I mean, we could, we could do this all the time, but um, there's, there's just not a consistent volume that. Well, because nobody wants to have refuse freight all the time on that consistent volume is not good business for anybody. We just encourage um, reach out to your contacts, your groups to get them to fill out the survey so that they can get on the list so that we know what's out there and uh, Mr. Porter's planning on uh, trying to see based on the response so that we can service you all but we also need cooperation to know what's there to coordinate with him so that he can plan a certain Saturday or whatever and that you all can go out there and drop off what you can. He's here to help. Excellent. On that line, if, um, but there are quite a few trailers of refused hand sanitizer that are still stuck here after since 2020. Uh, dangerous stuff. Stuck in people's warehouses, nothing to do. With, they can't do anything with it. Can't even so, give it away? Huh? They can't, can't even give, give it away? It, can't, they're stuck. Not they're not legally bound to hold it. And so if there's some option that you could help us come up with to dispose of that that doesn't include transporting it 200 miles to some other place, that would be awesome. So, I mean, you know, when you get into hazardous waste that's high, heavily regulated, um, that's, that's a tough issue. Um, I can help. I, 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 I hate to say this, but... You all are going to have to buy the bullet. Uh, I, I can help I, you yeah. with that because I spoke to Ponderosa when it belonged to Ponderosa. And apparently with everything that they dumped there, there's some fumes that are accumulated. And it has a name of that fume. And if you pour things like that there and with the with the with our environment, it, when it's, it's so hot, plus the machinery going through it, it can explode. And that's what they told us. And, mm -hmm. and they just rerouted us to Houston. That was like the closest to them that they would refer us to dispose. And, and then again, it's merchandise that has been refused by FDA that is strictly prohibited. Mm -hmm. if, if a kid gets a hold of it, they, if they swallow it, they can die. So they don't even let us export it. But you have a lot of different issues. You have issues that, that Mexico is saying, well, if you send it back to me, I'll give you credit. The other one is they, they went bankrupt. And then you have other cases that are in, in, in court right now with the FDA because they don't, they don't want to give it back to them. So you have different scenarios, and there's a lot of warehouses. I mean, you, you saw that there's a lot of people interested because they probably have some type of hand sanitizers in their warehouse. They have, I, I'm they sure every do. single one of us has too many hand sanitizers in our home. Exactly. Yeah, so I can just imagine the amount out there in, in, uh, in the warehouses. And, and I spoke to Congressman Quay, and I told him, Quay, I mean, this is something that they want. If that's what they want, well, they should pay for the destruction because nobody can, they, they can't even do anything with it anymore. Yeah. So it's in the hands of the FDA. They should be able to dispose of it to see what happens. But that's, that's reality. I mean, that would be great, um, but I'm not going to hold my breath. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if, if you all, if we're, we're seeing that here, I'm sure that's. Uh, okay, if if you can help yeah. us with the yeah. congressman as well, that it's it's kind of dangerous to be having all those things around the city, and that 
he should help the city as well. That would be from your part, from the city's mm -hmm. part, that it is stagnant. And we told him this can be another that place that blew up. I mean, with chemicals. That's that's what we told him. It's gonna it can get dangerous. Yeah, I had mentioned that council. There was a there's a, a landfill in Missouri that caught fire and it burned for six years and uh, cost $200 million to, to put out and remediate. So, um, yeah, landfill fires are very serious. And so. Well, thank you for your quick update. <laughs> All right. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for coming. No, seriously, thank you. Thank and, you for uh, coming. I'm getting, pr I'm getting pressure to move things along, and, yeah. and uh, that's. Yeah, so do we have any other business to speak about? This evening? Okay. Nope. Uh, schedule next meeting date, item number seven. It will be for January. I've lost track of our normal cadence. Is it the third week, third Wednesday of the month? Is that what's typical? And so if we look at our calendars and, and revert back to our... The 18th? So January 18th uh, is, I guess, will be the proposal for the next meeting date. Wednesday? Action. January 18th. We get a motion. Um, I guess we need a motion. motion. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Second. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Motion passes. Uh, last item on the agenda is adjournment. Uh, does anybody have a motion for an adjournment? Okay. I can, I can do that? I can. We just did it. You adjourn rather than make the motion for the meeting. Well, see, I... I I thought we were voting on the on the meeting date. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But no, Ross, nobody said adjourn until they second it. So we didn't get a meeting date on the record. So motion to motion. to revisit okay. item. Motion to revisit item for the schedule. For Seven. The schedule Can next we meeting open date. The meeting? Can we have a, I have a motion that we reconvene the meeting briefly. Reopen. Second. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, okay. Thank <laughs> you, Robert. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 A meeting reopened. Motion to now I move that we make January uh, 18th our next meeting date at six o'clock. We have second. 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 I move that we have. All second. those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Now I move that we adjourn. Aye. Second. Aye. All those in favor? Aye. We got it. Thank you. Thank you all. Appreciate you. Happy New Year. Merry Christmas.